what we've built with Onify is a fractional ownership platform. And the way that works in a very simple way is um, to say we allow the first time buyer um, to pick a home. And it's, these are starter homes, right? So single family homes, generally they're in the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar range, depending on the market. We allow the customer to pick the home. We execute a transaction as an all cash buyer, right? Purchase the home. And then we fractionalize the home into 10,000 bricks. Now, a brick is a hypothetical, it's not, a, it's not really a brick, but it's a share, right? An ownership share in the entity that holds title to the home. Folks, to tell you how big of a problem this is, recently, like the, the corporate home buyer, the institutional home buyer has become such a thing that if any of you who listen to me talk about commercial real estate investments all the time, you we talk about cost segregation, right? Tax benefits and, and, and being able to, you know, use those to offset other gains. Well, that's a, also a big, uh, a, a big attractor for corporate investment in real estate. The government recently passed a, a resolution to where, hey, okay, if, if you are a large institution and you are buying over X amount of homes, you no longer get to take this kind of depreciation. And so it, it's gotten so bad that the, the policy writers are starting to try to adjust policy to deter it because that is not their goal for housing that is built. It is not the, the intent for it to be gobbled up by institutions to where what, what Blackstone says is by 20, you will own nothing and be happy about it, right? We're allowing that to happen in this regard. You're listening to the Real Estate Runway podcast powered by Quattro Capital where we're all about alternative business and investment strategies to help you amplify life and maximize wealth. Here's your host, Chad, the Investment Maverick. All right, all right, all right. Real Estate Runway family, welcome to another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. I'm your host, Chad Sutton, and we are... Look, we're here with Frank Road today with Onify, and I'm so excited for a game-changing conversation in the housing industry that we're going to have today. Before we bring him on the show and, and start talking about this amazingness, if you get any value out of this show or anything that we do here at Quattro and Real Estate Runway, share it, like it, subscribe it, swipe it, wherever you're watching it, just do something to it. And that will tell the algorithm that you liked it and that will pay it forward. So somebody else can get this free content that we do just for people like you. So pay it forward. Don't be selfish. We appreciate the heck out of you. Frank, welcome to the show. Good to have you on, brother. How are you? Good. Thanks, Chad. Nice to see you and uh, excited to be here. Yes, folks, we were nerding out about our 4K cameras here a moment ago. So we're hoping we're coming through crisp and you can see every defect in our faces if you're looking at us on YouTube. If not, you can imagine them. So we're both bearded. I mean, ugly you don't have that algorithm that makes you look younger and, and better. I don't that need it. Just I, I don't I don't need this is no accident. You know? <laughs> so, Frank, before we get into what Onify is doing, give me your backstory, man. Like what, what you've done some amazing things in life and business. Walk me through all of it and end with what you're doing at Onify, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, all right. Where, where do I start? All the way back. I was born in Germany um, and uh, grew up there. Uh, came to the U.S. Uh, for college. Um, went to school on the East Coast in Philadelphia, uh, Penn, uh, the, the Wharton undergrad program. And, um, and so I had, uh, had always wanted to you know, come to the U.S. and live in the U.S. Um, and then ended up making that work. Um, and then joined a consulting firm on the West Coast, and I'm still here in San Francisco. So I'm, I'm one of the few people who've been in San Francisco for a long time. Um, and, and you know, through that, really got into financial services, kind of fintech early on, um, consulting um, in the, you know, in 99, started a company with a couple of colleagues uh, focused on online insurance and uh, built that up. Uh, unfortunately, it failed. So I think we're going to talk about failures. That's definitely one of the learnings and lessons there, um, um, but got into the entrepreneurship game pretty early on and was very excited about it, right? And so this notion of starting companies, trying to figure out how do you solve a big problem and how do you do it in a way that, you know, generates uh, a, a real solution for a large number of people and quite frankly, you know, generates return to investors as well. So anyway, um, so that company, eCoverage, didn't work out. Um, I worked for uh, FICO uh, for a while, got really deep into credit scoring, uh, credit risk, uh, how do the systems work that banks and lenders use. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, uh, started another company 
uh, called Nomis, which is a software company, um, still is, uh, that had built, and, and what we built ultimately was the pricing engine for lenders. Um, ah. And so we built that up um, to the point where, you know, the majority of uh, the large US lenders, Canadian lenders, Australian lenders were using that engine to figure out how do you price a loan? How do you price a mortgage, a car loan? And so I spent 15 years deep in the bowels of mortgage math. Um, and that is relevant to the story and kind of where, where we are today and what I'm doing today. Um, so saw a lot of the data, right, that the large lenders were seeing. Um, and as part of that, through the credit crunch and then uh, the recovery, um, saw this problem more and more, and in particular over the last couple of years, that you know the the first time buyer was struggling um, in getting their foot into the into the first home, right? So this notion that young people in particular um, are having a harder and harder time um, getting into um, real estate, and decided ultimately that you know within the system it's very hard to change that because by and large the way the mortgage market works in the U.S. is you know, very structured, very much uh, controlled by uh, rules that are ultimately written by the government sponsored entities. And so there's very little flexibility that you have within that system to truly change the path and the on ramp. Right. And this actually then went back to kind of my, my, you know, my story when I first came to San Francisco and looked to buy a condo at the time, I didn't have enough of a down payment, had to borrow money from my family, and they were kind enough to lend me the money. And, you know, eventually I paid them back, uh, which it turns out, you know, 50% of first-time buyers do. So if you think about this, and this is what we started looking at is, you know, why do you need to, why do you need your family's help? Why isn't there, you know, a market-based system that helps first-time buyers get into the market with a lower down payment, lower monthly payment, better affordability? And so that's what we set out to do. So I ultimately ended up selling the, the software company and uh, started Onify with a mission to create a better path for first-time buyers. And um, and so happy to double click on you know all the underlying reasons there, but that's that's kind of been the journey, right? Um, kind of working for the big banks, and now ultimately, I wouldn't say competing with them, but trying to build an alternative and a better path, right? That helps first-time buyers in particular. So you've been in the bowels of FICO and and Nomis. So basically, we could change direction here, and you could tell us all how to get credit cards and bypass all the systems, right? Is that how we do, how we should do that? The, theoretically, yes. <laughs> Those systems are really, really good, right? Um, and uh, and and it, it's very hard to get around them. But I think one of the things that that really we've learned, or I've learned, right, is um, that. These these companies are very large. They have existing rules, right? And everyone works within those rules, right? And right. it's very hard to rethink what does ownership mean? What does, you know, how do you buy property in the U.S. today? There's a very established way of doing that. And no one has really rethought that or challenged that. And this this gets into fractional ownership, right? Which is ultimately kind of at the core of what we're trying to do with Onify. Um that is very hard to do, right? And it's it, and it's it kind of breaks a lot of the rules that the industry lenders, mortgage lenders, you know, title companies, lawyers in the real estate yeah. space yeah. have built, um, and that you know the 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 market has kind of been playing by for a long, long time. So let, let's talk about breaking these rules. And folks, if you hear any loud knocks at the door, that's probably the SEC and, and the FICO people coming to haul us off for the comment that I just made. So anyway, luckily we're not live. <laughs> so anyway, but let's let's kind of transition to that. And so I think, you know, most of us have bought homes before, but I don't want to assume anything. And I, I want to I want to see the status quo of today through Frank through Frank's eyes and his mind. Okay. So before we get into how we're attempting to change the status quo and solve a problem. Let's talk about what is, what is the current way that people are buying homes, you know, from your eyes, hitting all the high points that you see are important and why is it a problem? Yeah. Yeah. If you think about the, the first time buyer, right. Um, tends to be in their maybe late twenties, early thirties. And in fact, the average age of the first time home buyer in the U S keeps going up, right? It's, Last year, I think last statistics I saw was at 36. 
and it's inching up towards 40 years because more and more people are getting squeezed out. So why is and that? Hold on. Hold on. So, so why yeah. why is that? We've, we've read papers saying, oh, the, the millennials just value experiences over homeownership. Is it that or can they just not freaking afford it? <laughs> what, what's the It's cost? the latter. It's, they, they can't afford it, right? And there's a bunch of reasons for that. And the first reason... So let's let's dive into this a little bit, right? Yeah. The first yeah. reason is home prices themselves, and everyone you know listening to this podcast mm. uh, is aware of this, and most everyone is aware of that. Home prices keep going up. Um, they've slowed down a little bit over the last maybe 18, 24 months as mortgage rates have gone up. But if you look at the ratio of home prices to income, they're at the highest level in 70 odd years, right? The ratio, wow. average ratio in the U.S. of the the, the median home price to the median income is somewhere around seven, right? It's the highest it's ever been since records started get, being kept in, in the 30s, right? Now, now how, how so have, old is that problem? So going back to the 30s, but how old is that problem? I know the last four or five years, we've seen, what, 30% appreciation per year? It's been pretty wild. Is this a recent yeah. issue or how long have you been seeing this? It's it's a relatively recent issue. We've had a housing bubble, right? Obviously in, in right. the, the 2000 four, five, six range prior to the crash and house prices went up significantly then, right? And, but if you look at the average over the long run, um, the, the house price to uh, household income ratio has been around 5X, right? Okay. And it's now above 7X since wow. um, really the pandemic. That's right? telling. So we've seen this run up right, in, in house price to income ratio. Um, and so that's that's the first metric, right? And the first, Problem. The second problem, then more recently, over the last really two years, is that mortgage rates are also at 20 plus year highs. Right? So you have the cost of the home itself relative to income, and then you have the cost of the debt that you need in order to buy the home. Right. So if you have mortgage rates that are in the sevens, um, and maybe they come down this year into the sixes, right? And you know everyone has their forecast, and no one is good at forecasting. But you know the the relative increase in rates from the you know threes that we saw post pandemic to now six and seven percent right has increased the monthly payment for the first time buyer significantly so you have you have um home prices themselves then you have the payment required as a function of mortgage rates you also have um for first time buyers um significant increase over the last 10 years in student debt so if you look at the average student debt to income ratio, that's now in the 60% or so for folks who graduate from college. Go back 10 years. Six, hold on, hold on. 60% of student debt to income these days? Student debt to income for the average college graduate. Right? Wow. So you go back and you think about, okay, first time buyer, right? Maybe late 20s, early 30s, um, 50% or so, you know, possibly more have um, a, a college degree, right? Which is great sets them up for, for income potential, but you have this drag of student debt that you have to pay back. For, Frank, right, I, so have that, to, I have to put that into perspective, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong here. If, if average debt to income, let's just go averages. If average is 60%, mostly they won't lend you a home above 30%. So let's say you're around there. That's 90% of your income gone if you buy a home before you ever start to live. Am I understanding that right? Yeah, it, it, the, the math is maybe a little different in that it's 60% mm. of the, the balance, right? So let's say you make 100000 and you have $60,000 in student debt, right? But what a lender will do is they will look at that $60,000 student loan balance and they'll take a point, right? 1%, usually sometimes half a percent. Yeah. Say that is the implied student loan payment. And that comes off of your DTI, your debt to income ratio, right? Mm. Or your affordability calculation. Right. Okay. Um, okay. And so again, from a budget perspective, right, you've got mortgage rates that are higher. You've got house prices that are high. You have student debt that's weighing down on the average consumer, the average first time buyer. So that's three. Then, then the fourth thing is we've had a tax change a couple of years ago, right? Um, that basically did away with the mortgage uh, interest tax deduction for most first time buyers. Because as you well know, Right, you have to itemize your taxes in order to claim mortgage interest deduction. And if you're looking at the average first-time buyer who maybe makes a hundred, eighty, ninety, a hundred, hundred twenty thousand, right, they don't make enough to itemize their taxes. They don't pay enough in mortgage interest to make that worthwhile. So they're taking the standard deduction. So that kind of subsidy that we used to get from the federal government um, through mortgage interest tax deduction is no longer there. So you have that, and then you have an environment where, depending on which market you look at, you have investors and cash buyers, you know, Blackstone, BlackRock, 
private equity firms coming in, buying homes and turning them into rentals, right? So a, a first time buyer um, in, you know, we, we're live in Raleigh, Durham, we see this all the time, uh, but you see it in most cities, right? You're competing against cash buyers, right? Uh, a lot of times corporate buyers. And so in that environment, the likelihood that a first time buyer who comes in with a starter mortgage, an FHA mortgage, for example, the likelihood that that buyer wins in a competitive bid situation is very, very low, right? And so you've got all these things coming together and it's kind of creating this perfect storm that makes it really hard for first-time buyers to get in. And yeah. so what's the net, net effect? You have renters staying in rentals longer. You have more people yeah. living with their parents, right? And you you are delaying what is arguably the largest creation of, of wealth, right, for the average American um, by years and years and years because people can't get into the homes that uh, that ultimately you know, build equity and, and uh, uh, you know, financial security for them. And so that's the, that's the core problem that we're looking to solve. Yeah. And, and to tell you folks, to tell you how big of a problem this is recently, like the, the corporate home buyer, the institutional home buyer has become such a thing that if any of you who listen to me talk about commercial real estate investments all the time, you, we talk about cost segregation, right? Tax benefits and, and being able to, you know, use those to offset other gains. Well, that's also a big, uh, a big attractor for corporate investment in real estate. The government recently passed a, a resolution to where, hey, okay, if, if you are a large institution and you are buying over X amount of homes, you no longer get to take this kind of depreciation. And so it, it's gotten so bad that the the policy writers are starting to try to adjust policy to deter it because that is not their goal for housing that is built. It is not the, the intent for it to be gobbled up by institutions to where what, what Blackstone says is by 2040, you will own nothing and be happy about it, right? It, <laughs> we're, we're allowing that to happen in the, in this regard. So we'll see who's right, the, uh, the, the federal government or Blackstone. Um, but let's, 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 so let's keep going with this here. We, we've kind of set the stage for the problem. And so let's kind of, let's kind of turn into what are the levers you've, you're starting to pull to, and, and what do you see as the solution? Like, what is the new way that, uh, that you guys have come up with? Yeah. So the, the fundamental question we asked is why do you have to buy a hundred percent of the home? Mm. Right. Why couldn't you buy a fraction of the home that you live in <clears throat> and build equity over time, um, but not have the obligation to ever buy 100 percent of the home? Hmm. Right. And uh, and why do you have to use debt to buy the home? Now, there's a bunch of advantages to debt, but there's also a bunch of disadvantages, especially for a first time buyer. And so what we've built with Onify is a fractional ownership platform. And the way that works in a very simple way is um, to say we allow the first-time buyer um, to pick a home, and it's, these are starter homes, right? So single-family homes, generally they're in the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar range, depending on the market. We allow the customer to pick the home. We execute a transaction as an all-cash buyer, right? Purchase the home, and then we fractionalize the home into ten thousand bricks. Now, a brick is a hypothetical. It's not. A, it's not really a brick, but it's a share. Right, an ownership share um, in the entity that holds title to the home, and so you're you're going to be familiar with this, right? Investors know this. The home actually is uh, put into an LLC. An LLC holds title to the home. We issue ten thousand shares in that LLC. Each share is a brick, right? And the customer enters an agreement where they purchase two hundred bricks or two percent. That's the down payment, if you will, on day one. They become a bonafide member of that LLC. So they have real interest in that LLC. And they sign a five-year agreement um, that has three components. One component is that they build equity over those five years. They start with 200 bricks. And they buy roughly 13 bricks every month to the point where after five years, they have a thousand bricks or 10% of the LLC value. At the same time, they sign a uh, lease agreement that allows them to obviously live in the property and pay rent on the fraction of the equity on the bricks that they haven't purchased. So for the consumer, right, a simple way to think about it is to say, I have my pile of bricks and I need to rent the other pile, right? Because every house has 10,000 bricks. And so while I'm buying bricks, my stack gets bigger. The stack that I have to pay rent on gets smaller. 
So rather than principal and interest, you have rent and equity purchase. And then the third piece of the agreement is that the, at any point during the five years or at the end of five years, you can purchase the home from the LLC at the then current market value, right? And that basically the design here is that once you have 10% of the equity built up, you can use that as a down payment for a traditional mortgage, right? And then use that mortgage to buy the home from the LLC in a non-competitive bid, right? You're not competing against anyone. You can take all the time you need to get that mortgage in place, right? Get qualified. But the purchase is done at the then current value. So one of the core pieces yeah. and one of the pieces of innovation here is that we value each home every month and the value of the bricks that is being traded, right, that the customer is buying over time is based on the then current market value of the home. And the purchase option right, at the end of five years is also at the then current market value. And so what that does for the investor, if I'm investing in those bricks, <clears throat> I get two things. One is I get rental income right, on a fraction of the home. And two, I get the appreciation of those bricks, right? So if I'm a landlord in the traditional way, I'd buy the whole house, maybe finance it with debt. I hold it, you know, I get rental income, I get appreciation. What we're enabling uh, through this construct of bricks is we're enabling the investor to get uh, rental income and home price appreciation on as little as one brick, right, or 10 bricks, it's the current minimum of, a, uh, of an individual home. And so for the investor, right, it creates that um, real estate investment value proposition, but with a much lower entry point in that, you know, you can, you can buy 10 bricks in a uh, $300,000 home, 10 bricks, you know, is a starting point of $300. So you can, you can start investing in real estate um, with a, a much lower, you know, upfront uh, investment than traditionally has been possible. So, so that's the construct. And so why, why does that work? Well, one, it gives the consumer, the first time buyer, an all cash offer. It gives them a partner that is a professional home buyer, right? Um, doing inspections, valuations, making sure that the property we're buying <clears throat> is an attractive property. We cover uh, maintenance and repairs, um, insurance, property taxes, et cetera, for the first five years, right? Um, but it gives the consumer payment certainty, right? There's no increase in the payment for the first five years, right? And so it really creates this in-between path between renting, which is the traditional path, and buying with a mortgage, right? Um, and it makes it a lot easier for the, for the customer to get into the market. And then on the investor side, the value prop is you can invest in that property. It's a lower you know, entry point in terms of cost. And one of the things that we found uh, since we started, which is really interesting, is the, the rental yield is above market. Right, because the product itself has uh, benefits to the consumer, so we're getting very attractive rental yields. We're getting lower maintenance and repair costs because of that co-ownership mentality. Right, right. You don't have uh, just a tenant living in the home; you have a co-owner who's taking care of it. And so we've seen that that folks, you know, are fixing uh, homes. They're you know repainting. They're replacing carpets. They're doing things that normally you would call your landlord. And, and uh, you know, ask them to do it. They're doing it themselves as co-owners. And so obviously we're encouraging that through this equity ownership piece. And then ultimately we believe that, you know, um, over time that also contributes to the valuation and the appreciation of the property itself. Um, so all else equal creates a higher return for the investor, right? By, by having this partnership between the investor and the, the co-owner, i.e. The, the, the ONI as we call them. This is really so. I have so many questions. Bear with me for just a second. This this is yeah. great. I'm just I'm I'm processing this here. So let me let me live on the side of the the homeowner for a moment, or the or the homeowner slash renter for a moment. <clears throat> so we've identified this home as the homeowner, and we've approached Onify, and that there's some sort of approval process or something similar to a mortgage, I would assume, for them to qualify with their income and all that. And then you're going to say, okay, we're going to buy it for you. And we're going to set it up. Here's, here's, you know, you explain the brick concept and the rent, rent my bricks versus buy my bricks, which I love the way you do that because I think people can really understand that. The first time home buyer can probably understand that better than the, the GSE mortgage sheet that they get, right? And so, so you have this and you value the home monthly. So it's valued at purchase, obviously. And yep. then you have some sort of market index. And so the value of the 10,000 bricks is monthly adjustable. So it's, it's kind of an adjustable rate mortgage, but not really. 
And so, so that the value adjusts over time. And so every month when I buy 13 bricks, I have to be ready that my, my, my payment might go up a little bit, or, or maybe I only buy eight bricks this month or something like that, but I can figure that out. But over time I can see the seesaw rather that it's, it's the same as the principal interest seesaw really. Uh, but it's more, you know, rented bricks versus owned bricks. So you understand that. And over time, I at least have a path to get to 10% ownership. And then of course, above and beyond that is, so I guess the requirement is they get to 10% ownership and above that they have the option at any given time to buy the other 90% or portion of, right? Correct. Correct. Okay. Exactly I right. see. So, so if you will, the, the, the 10% is analogous to the mortgage. You must pay these regardless, but the others, like then once you get above and beyond, you're, you're in better shape. So let's go to the investor side. The, and you, you mentioned as little as three hundred dollars, right? So, so this is this is set up as some sort of of exempt syndication or crowdfunding or something like that on the investment side, right? So, so what we're doing is two pieces here. One is a Reg A exemption with the SEC Reg a. that allows okay. us to sell these uh, bricks to any investor in the U.S. Not just accredited investors, but any investor, right? Subject to obviously constraints and rules mm -hmm. and all that. And and that you know that filing. Uh, that 1A filing is with the SEC. So, you know, it's visible. It's on our website. <clears throat> and we've been super transparent on that. Uh, transparent on that. Yes. The other piece we're doing is we're, we're raising a fund, right? And that's a Reg D fund for accredited investors to invest across all the homes and effectively have built-in uh, diversification, right? Got it. And so one path is you can pick a home specifically to say, I know Chad, I trust him. I like the house he lives in. I want to invest in that house, right? And I want to buy bricks in that home. And the reason we set it up that way is that we have a strong thesis that the customers actually bring in their own, we call them circle of trust. So family members, friends, the community, their church, right? Where folks can co-invest into the home of someone they actually know, right? And we've seen a lot of folks who say, I like, I want to invest in my community, right? Because I live here and I, and I believe that home ownership is good for the community, um, so you can pick individual homes or you can invest in the fund to say, I like the construct. I like helping first time buyers. I want to earn return. Right. But I also want the diversification. Quite frankly, I don't want to bother picking individual homes. So, you know, you can do that through through a fund as well. OK, so Both so then. So for, yeah. So from the investor side, if I'm looking at this as like, wow, this is incredible socioeconomic and humanitarian benefit. Like this is this is do good while you do well, like to a T. Right. And so th this is wonderful. And so as an investor, I could be a non-accredited investor with as little as maybe 300 bucks or whatever the number is at the time. And I would invest in the Reg A fund, which, yep. you know, is advertised and all that. And then I, but I, you're also sophisticated enough where I could say, I want to invest in my son's home or whatever. And, and from that fund, you could divert those funds to the right sub LLC, if you will. Okay, I see. And then on the other side, if I'm an accredited investor and I want to invest half a million bucks in this, I just go into the Reg D fund. And then similarly, you could divert me to a, 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 a geographical area or an individual or a group of individuals or, or things. So that, that's, that right there is sophistication in, in how you're allocating the funds. I mean, that, that's, uh, I don't want to gloss over that at all. Um, so incredible. Did I get that right? Yeah, you know, you got it exactly right. And so... The whole idea here is right. This, this this is a double bottom line investment in that we've you know we're monetizing um, the asset in a way that generates good return, but we're also solving this problem right, which is homes are being snapped up by institutional buyers, and we're preventing people from building a path to ownership right. So yeah. if we can kind of bring the community together to help solve that, that's the core mission. This is fantastic. And and so folks, I just mentioned this is socioeconomic and humanitarian benefit. This is great for the first time home buyer. I'm going to go on a limb and say that the 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 uh cost per bricks for rental and acquiring that they're paying is probably going to be a better ratio than the than the mortgage they would be paying at any given time. Um, but they're at least building towards ownership. And so let's let's talk about let's go back to the investor hat. I I see a lot of ways this is great. What, you know, I, I'm a typical rental investor. I understand how rentals work and debt and all that kind of stuff. You're not putting debt on the property. So default is not a risk, but what, what are the risks as an investor or, and how do you mitigate them with, you know, the rules in the LLC and the lease agreement and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. 
So this this is where the time at FICO and at Nomas and you know the the being in the bowels of mortgage math kind of really um, really paid off, I think. So what we've built here to if you think about it from an investor perspective, there is the um, risk around the the customer, right? So does the only uh, default and not pay, and you have to evict that customer? Do you have to go through some sort of bad scenario? And the way and to hold on, Frank, Frank, is, Frank, Frank. So, so default is that just not paying the rental cost, or is that not paying the rental and buying the thirteen bricks? Like, what constitutes could, a default? It could be either, right? Either, okay. It, yeah, and so, so at the end of the day, it's um, you know, does the customer live up to their obligations? And so, what we've done there is we've built um, an underwriting engine, right? And we look at a couple of thousand pieces of data. Uh, for each individual applicant. And today we're accepting about 1% of the applicants. So what that means is that if you look at our portfolio right now, the average FICO score is 744, right? Oh, okay. So these are folks yeah. who have pristine credit, but they don't have the savings for the down payment, which is really the hurdle we're solving for, right? Yeah. They have great incomes. They have student debt, as I described earlier, right? They have good jobs. and um, And so far we've had zero payment default. Right, because of that. So what we're focused yeah. on is very much generating um, good uh, customers in terms yeah. of their credit profile, right? So at, at least right now, you, you're, you're, you're prof not profiling. You are underwriting to a early but highly productive member of society. This is someone who cares about making their payments. They care about their credit. They've got a good job, maybe saddled with too much student debt. In a few years, they'll get that taken care of. This is the kind of person that exactly. really benefits. Yeah, I see. Okay. yeah. If, if you think about the hurdle, right, for the first time buyer, it's generally three things. One is income, very hard to solve for. If you don't make enough money, buying a home will always be hard. Two is credit, right? If you, have, if you haven't managed your credit, you're not paying your bills on time and you have poor credit, you can't get a mortgage. You also can't get Onify to help you, right? Because that is a, that is a risky proposition for any investor. Yeah. And then the third hurdle is the down payment. And that's quite frankly, the biggest hurdle and the one that we're helping first time buyers overcome. That makes so, a lot of sense. Yeah. So then the second risk, if you think about it from an investor perspective, is you have a default risk, right? Um, and you can mitigate that by underwriting customers. And you can mitigate it through the product structure itself. And this is why building this as equity and bricks is important compared to a mortgage. The risk that you had in mortgages, zero down mortgages, we go back to 2007, 2008, 2009, is that as soon as home prices fall a little bit, Right, you have someone in a with a three hundred thousand dollar mortgage and their house is worth two fifty. They look at it and go, "Well, I'm underwater. I'm just going to mail the keys back to the bank." Right? They call it the jingle mail. Right? Strategic defaults, um, and people walk away. In the way we've built uh, Onify this this product is the customer builds equity, right? And there's no debt in the stack. And so if the home price falls, right? As a customer, I have two percent on day one. That's what I put down. And then I build to three and four and five and six percent, but that sliver of equity is still worth whatever it's worth, even if home prices fall. So you don't have this risk of the customer saying, "Hey, I'm just going to, you know, not live up to my obligations," because they have that investment in the stack alongside the the investors as well. And so then the third risk is is obviously home price appreciation or the asset risk itself, right? You buy a house and it either doesn't appreciate or it depreciates. And that's where a lot of the focus for us has been on picking the right markets, right? That have long-term structural uh, economic drivers, i.e., growth, income creation, job creation, people moving, right? Uh, which is driving home prices. And we look at individual assets and do, um, you know, a valuation process where we look at the individual homes to make sure that these are assets that that increase in value. And so, if you think about, you know, kind of the average return for single family rental investment unlevered is 8.3% long run, right? And it's usually half is appreciation and half is current yield, right? And what we're doing is we've generated somewhere around 11, 11 and a half percent because we're picking properties that have above average appreciation and we're picking properties that have, you know, slightly higher rental yield. And we're trying to kind of hit the middle, right? Where both components, you have appreciation and, and current yield, where those two things balance themselves. Um, and if you do that right, then you can minimize the the investor risk, especially if you don't have leverage in the stack, right? Because the downside is right. unlimited. Um, and and yeah. so that's been the the value prop and the uh, the you know the the pitch to the investor community out there. 
Yeah, and, and I would I would go so far as to use the term asymmetric risk on this because you're you're really I mean you are the ultimate owner. So the the good thing is and, and let's you know all things being equal, typical housing market, this will work well. The let's let's stress test it for a moment together. So let's just pretend that we're doing this in 2007, right? We all know what yeah. happened, right? And so no, number one risk was well, gee, my home is now worth less than my mortgage. I may have loans getting called. That doesn't happen because you own the the entity controls and owns all of the home that the, that the homeowner doesn't have. Now, let's say that you do get in a situation where the home is worth less than what you have in it. You know, values are down 30%. Let's just say that, right? So, okay, yep. the, the ownership situation, yes, it's underwater. Are you selling it? No. So that's not really as big of an issue. But what does change is your monthly valuation model. And so let's just, so what, what I'm thinking of here is, okay, the returns on on that home or the portfolio or whatever in a in a heavy deleveraging situation where by the way everything is off if you know nothing is making a lot of money but yep. your downside risk is limited but you probably do feel a little bit of reduced return because and and I guess this is the great if if the homeowner happens to have enough cash or consistent cash to acquire as many bricks as he can. And let's say he or she is smart and realizes, hey, my home value is down 30 or 40%. I better buy as many bricks as I can today. Let's just assume they're that smart. You know, the, how does that affect the investment? Or is that really a, am I stacking too many unlikely situations together? You know what I'm no, saying? No, and, and what we've done, um, Chad, is exactly what you're describing, which is we ran something like 35,000 different simulations, right? Mm -hmm. And we said, okay, what if we did this in December of 2005 and in January of 2006 and, you know, every month um, throughout the cycle? And so there's a couple of things that, uh, that are at play here that come together. One is we have a five-year commitment, right? Um, so a five-year hold period. And if you look over a five-year hold period, generally, even during that, uh, call it 07 through 2012 period, unless you were in the Inland Empire or in some parts of Florida, right? Um, in the markets that we're in, you would have made money. You would have seen, um, you know, if not appreciation, at least flat values um, over that whole period, right? And th that's where the whole period helps. And, the, and as yeah. you say- So there's the downside you know, risk. You're mitigating the downside risk, right? You're mitigating the downside risk. Then structurally, the, what the product allows the customer to do is build up to 10% equity, but we cap them at 10%. So even if home prices fall, right? For the customer, what's interesting here is the customer is basically buying the home like through dollar cost averaging, right? Uh, if home prices fall, they're actually buying slightly more bricks every month. Right. So think of this as, you know, you invest in a mutual fund, you make your fixed payment and you're buying more and you know, higher number of shares in those months where home prices fall. So the customer builds equity faster, which is good for them, right? But they're capped at 10%. So they can't just go out and buy, you know, 50% um, at a reduced price. And then the third piece in the in the product design is that, the call option on the home, remember when we said earlier, the customer can buy the home from the investor, from the LLC at market value. However, there's a floor at least 5% above the entry price. So really the call option is at market or 5% above entry, whichever is higher, right? And that again, puts a downside protection in place for the investor to say, I cannot get bought okay. out because there's a fluke devaluation right? Or the market crashes in whatever, you know, particular town I'm in. I love that you've thought through all of this. And so like, by the way, this is a man after my own heart. He is a good, he, he does math well, and he's modeled lots of scenarios that, that, that speaks volumes to me as, as an investor. And, and so, okay. So just to reiterate what you just said, this, this, just talking to real estate investors here, this kind of, not, not really, but it kind of at the most basic fundamental level resemble, resembles a lease option where you're, they're renting the house technically from the LLC, but they have an option with certain restrictions to purchase it at any time. So monthly, they have the ability to buy up to 10%. They can't just say, hey, I'm going to throw an extra 10,000 at this and buy another 10%. That's under the call option. And, and so the call option is then limited to uh, 95 percent or was it 95 or 105 percent of initial value, 5 percent more or less? What was it? 5 percent yeah. more. So okay. So it's limited to 105 percent of initial valuation, which makes sense because in an option agreement, you set the value to, to protect your downside. But they can't, 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 in that call option, can the home buyer 
let's say they now own 10%. Can he go buy 40% or must the call option be for the entire 90? The call option is for the entire 90. There, there it is. There's the protection. Okay. So basically they get to own the home, build equity, uh, you know, not have to worry about the down initial down payment all the while they they can have the home and be saving the down payment. And then when the time is right in the credit markets, pull the trigger on a conventional mortgage or something of that sort, but the home they already own and don't have to compete for. And then boom, I, I see, exactly. man, I see the vision, you know, it, it's incredible. So, uh, well, I could talk about this all day, folks, but I'm looking at our clock and we're already at, at, at 41 minutes after the hour. So Frank, I want to give you the opportunity because I know you're, you, most people can't handle this question. But I'm going to give it to you. W what did we not talk about that we need to on this structure from an investor or a home buyer perspective? I think we, we covered everything. <clears throat> the one piece you mentioned it kind of, there's a double bottom line here, right? And there's a, there's an economic benefit. There's also a societal benefit. So one of the things we've done <clears throat> is we've qualified Onify um, through a partner to be a DAF eligible investment, donor advised fund investment. So um, you can actually use um, charitable, charitable capital, capital yeah. right, to put into the fund to support this mission of home ownership. And you know, one of the things we're working on is, is allowing investors to then say, okay, I care about these causes, right? I care about these regions. I care about um, you know, segments that I want to help. How do I funnel capital into those causes specifically? So that, that's still you know, uh, something we're working on. But um, we're really looking to... to uh, acquire and attract capital that then also catalyzes market rate capital through this DAF option. And and folks, if you haven't discovered donor advised funds, go look at my my uh, prior episode on those or reach out. They are incredible tools if you have the means to be charitable um, and puts the, you know, you can have a foundation without the infrastructure of running a foundation. It's just incredible, you know, so yeah. let's get to the Quattro questions. We've got three minutes to get through these and then I've got to let Frank get back to running this amazing new company that he's built. Frank, superpower. What is your superpower in life or business and how does it serve you well? He's ripping um, off his shirt right now for those not watching us. You know, <laughs> you know th that's, yeah, it's a good question. I think the, the math piece, right, and really digging into how does financing work, right? The back to 15 years in the bowels of mortgage math and pricing, right? Building a pricing engine. So that that is, I don't know if it's a superpower that is, you know, attractive in the kind of, you know, you go to a cocktail party and say, like, hey, my superpower is mortgage math. <laughs> but it is for this purpose. That'll get him a date. Uh, my superpower, <laughs> right? And and so um, uh, I'm I'm happy that I found a way to use that skill uh, to do good in the world, right? And that's I, that's maybe the other one is trying to combine and use that not just to make money for you know me and investors, but for you know helping solve a real problem out there. And you know that's been. Honestly, the biggest win is is the, having the conversations with the first time buyers that we're helping, and seeing how their eyes light up and how excited they are to be in homes, right? Uh, where they didn't think that was possible. And so, combining those two, I, I love it. Cool. I have I have no further thing to add. That was perfect. Mike, drop it right there. Let's flip the coin over, Frank. What is your? You mentioned in the beginning we had one, but what's your biggest failure, life or business? And most importantly, what's the lesson you garnered from it? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I um, when you first asked this, you know, the the podcast title is Real Estate Runway. It is runway. It's having runway, right? That is so important. Having the optionality to say, you know, what we're building is hard. Any business you build is hard. It never goes according to plan, right? And so having the runway, uh, which ultimately means the funding, right, and the emotional and intellectual stamina to work through what are the obstacles that are out there, right? You need both. Um, and, you know, I, I do a, a fair amount of advisory work with, you know, younger entrepreneurs and, and startup founders. And I always coach them that, you know, building a business is like running a marathon. So you got to have runway, you got to have stamina, you got to have gas in the tank, and you don't want to run your first half faster than the second half, right? If you've ever done long distance running, right, that negative split of having enough to make it across the finish line, that's super important, right? So, So ultimately, that's about, you know, raising enough capital and having the runway and having the prudent financial picture, but also having the, you know, the fortitude to kind of stay the course, right. Or pivot as you, as you have to, but, you know, keep that gas in the tank. I, I love that you went there and I was hoping you would um, folks runway and I've never thought of it this way, but runway 
is gas in the tank, funding, cash. Cash flow moves a lot slower than cash. We just beat this dead horse in an episode with Travis Balcom talking about self-storage. And I think it's the one just prior to this, depending when this, was, when this one gets released. But the, folks, internalize that. Runway. And I love the way you said it. Cash equals runway. Funding equals runway. Time for the shameless plug. And I'm, I don't even think it needs to be shameless. This is like, this is so good. I want you to talk about it. Tell us how we can get involved with Onify if we're an investor or a home buyer and any other free stuff or podcasts or anything else you want to mention here, please do it now. Yeah. Um, as a home buyer, come to Onify, uh, get qualified. If we're not in your market yet, uh, join the wait list and we'd love to come to your market. Uh, as an investor, come to Onify, you know, and sign up for either the fund or directly into a property. Uh, you can get accredited and qualified or accredited. Um, and again, this is not a solicitation, right? We're going to do all this for the SEC guidelines. Um, so read the materials and, um, but, you know, come check us out. That's, that's the plug. And um, I know it's shameless, but that's, that is the, you know, the thing I'm excited about and probably the best way you can get involved and help. Team or team listeners, you hear me always talk about doing good while doing well. Well, this is it. This is this is the I'm, I'm so excited about this episode today, Frank. It's not even funny. So, OK, last one um, here at Quattro. We are big on philanthropy as one of our four pillars. After all, that is people, property, profits and philanthropy, a group of people coming together around property to generate profits, some of which are used for philanthropy, coming back and taking care of people. It's a circle, right? So yep. I love to give my guests an opportunity to just talk about your philanthropic heart, where you give your time, your talent, your treasures, arguably your business is this, you know, um, as it was qualified for a DAF. But what, what is that for you? You know, where do you give back, Frank? I, mostly through advisory work. So I'm part of a network um, here in, in, in Silicon Valley uh, called The Alchemist um, that helps first time founders and young entrepreneurs kind of think through, you know, how do you build a business? Um, what are all the challenges? So that's that's just volunteer work, um, a couple hours a week. Um, I do fundraising. Um, and my favorite charity, and this is the other maybe shameless plug, is a charity called Room to Read. That uh, it's, a, it's a place that builds libraries in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in poorer countries in Southeast Asia. And the idea is that you can fund an individual library for as little as $20,000, right? have it staffed and give access to books to children in countries and in places where they don't have that. Right. Um, so very, very powerful because I think education is so important and so powerful, right. In lifting people out of poverty. Um, so that's a favorite one. Um, yeah. Those are, those are the two. Incredible. Frank, this has been a pleasure of an episode. I'm so glad that you you found our show because this is a very noteworthy topic, very noteworthy problem to solve and a very creative solution to it. Uh, I, 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 I hope you'll come back to the show in six months or a year and just, uh, you know, tell us how it's going. You know, I'd love to, to hear the progress and the lives you've touched. So thank you for coming on, sharing your time your, and your knowledge. And, uh, we'll see you in six months. I hope. Cool. Thanks, Chad. Really nice chatting and glad to be here. All right, everyone. This has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway Podcast. As we mentioned earlier, if you got any value out of this show, especially, or any other show that we do, Swipe it, like it, share it, subscribe to it. Just do something so the algorithm knows you liked it and pay it forward, folks. Until next time, this has been another episode of the Real Estate Runway podcast. Over and out. We hope this episode was insightful and brought value to your day. If so, please be awesome and leave us a five-star review. Find out how Team Quattro can help you at thequattroway.com and scroll down for more info. Until next time, this is the Real Estate Runway podcast.